It's a balmy, uh, I don't know about four degrees, but I'm all bundled up to bring you this February edition of Local Image. And while I'm wearing multiple layers, many others around me are scantily clad as they prepare to jump in here at the Polar Bear Plunge on White Bear Lake. I have a feeling that some in the crowd tapped into a little liquid courage before they dipped into the icy water, and I don't blame them. And speaking of taps, the long-awaited opening of White Bear Lake's new brewery with a tap room is finally here. And we are as excited as many of you to go inside Bigwood Brewery for a sample. And that's exactly what we have on tap for you in this exclusive Local Image segment. It just so happened that we both like beer a lot. Steve's personality is all about making people laugh. The brand was all about setting the table for people to have a good time and put a smile on their face. This is what we are, we're real people. When I tell them I own a brewery, they're like, I know you don't think I should probably own a car, but I actually own a brewery. When you have a smile on your face, every day is a great day. And, and then if you don't, you can go have a beer and that'll put a smile on your face. We were gonna be in Northeast Minneapolis and being a brewery, they want you to come to their town. So Minneapolis said, hey, we're going to have 14 breweries in Northeast Minneapolis. It's going to be a little mecca. I go, it's great. I don't want to be one of 14. I wanted, I wanted to go somewhere special. I wanted it to be um, where I felt like the community would get behind me. It was like my people. And we had spent so much time designing this business, sitting at Manitou, uh, drinking beer, and then forgetting what we did, and then the next day, starting over. Um, so we had spent a lot of time doing that in this town and we fell in love with it. White Bear Lake's just a quaint little town with not a lot of chain restaurants, which is awesome. You can come here and eat at one of the great restaurants that we have here in this town. So we wanted to fit into that and we wanted to kind of be a part of that culture. So we found this building built in 1906 and so that had a bunch of challenges with it. We had to order everything custom. Everything was custom manufactured for this space. That took extra time, um, but we're happy with it. It turned out really good, and we hope that people will be uh, impressed with the amount of thought and everything that went into it, as well as the beers. This is where the true magic happens. Uh, it's a real fun process. You know, it's, it's you just gotta be right on. This beer, if this turn, this beer turns out to be fantastic, which I, I think it might. It has a chance, I'm gonna give it a chance. Um, the next time I go to brew it, uh, the more notes I take and the more specific and precise I can be, the easier it is get for me to, to be able to duplicate it. We love festivals because that's where we get to connect with, with our target market and our people and the people who love our beer. And that's where you get to cheers and say hey and, and everybody's happy. It's a great time. It's for me, it's about, um, it's about the brand. It was my idea. So Big Wood, you know, someone, says, someone said, once said, you're a genius, Big Wood Brewery. I go, really? I came up with the three words. I put them together, but it is some, I think it is something special, and if it doesn't go to the lengths I think it should go, it's an insult to my idea almost, and I want to make sure I get there. So that's, that's what's important to me. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be big. So hopefully they'll come in here, you know, they'll have a couple of beers, try some really good beers, try a flight, and then go out to eat at one of the great restaurants. I think the support in White Bear Lake has been, I, I would say surprising, I expected it. But I don't know that I expected it to the level of, that we get it. I mean, there's a lot of good people here that have just are rooting for you. Try our beers, um, try them with an open mind, and try the different flavors. There's a lot of great breweries here in Minnesota. So, drink Minnesota craft beer. Big Wood couldn't be more 
awesome and the location couldn't be better. So be sure to come out to White Bear Lake to take in the brewery and all that this great community has to offer, including a new event happening right here on the lake. It's the Art Shanty Project and it's happening every weekend in February. We'll bring you coverage of it on our next show, so stay tuned. Meanwhile, let's check out a different kind of fun on the ice and meet a young lady from North St. Paul who shares her passion for speed skating and her drive to make it to the Olympics. My dream has always been to go to the Olympics. My parents have given up so much for me to be able to compete and so much time and money and like letting me go and do my thing and follow my dreams. I was hit by a car and then I got better and then I was overtrained and had to take a whole summer off and then I spent a whole year getting back to where I was before then and then I got a concussion and it was kind of like living with mono for a year and so I finally got over that last January. That's when I saw the concussion doctor and then over the last summer I pulled a muscle in my low back so I had to take a whole another month off of training which is really hard going into an Olympic season like you don't want to because the summer months are the most important so that's not when you want to be taking time off. Um, I was terrible at speed skating when I started actually like I was last place all the time I just like loved the sport and I grew up skating in Roseville outside so you grow up like just working on that ice all the time because it's like windy and snowy and it's just so much harder and then um, when I was 15 actually right after I got hit by the car I ended up moving to Milwaukee and I uh, was training there the whole time and um, I've been there ever since on speed skating's hands down, like the hardest thing I've ever done. You skate in such an awkward position that you're building lactic acid from the second like you start skating. So it's like a very anaerobic sport all the time versus if you're a runner or a cyclist, like it's very aerobic and you can go for a long time. So we really like incorporate a lot of different things because it's a very power-based sport too. So you'll do a lot of weightlifting and then you have to have a very good like aerobic system and then a lot of anaerobic threshold going on. We do probably six hours of training a day and then usually in the morning it'll be something a little more aerobic just to kind of wake up your system and get that going. And then we do strength training with like jumps and weights two to three times a week too. And then just off ice we'll do technique work before every ice session. This is one of our skin suits that we skate in. They're made of rubber so they're more aerodynamic and they have mesh so you can move your legs a little better but um, they're kind of goofy looking but this is what helps us go fast so we just have these all over our house now. These are our skates. Um, the blades are anywhere between like 16 to 17 and a half inches long and they open up when you skate so that when you're pushing when you're done pushing, your blade can keep going while you're pulling your foot back, so you have a longer push on the ice, and it just stays on the ice longer and helps you go faster. It's on TV this year for us, which is a huge deal. Um, it'll be a lot of exposure for the sport. I try not to think about it too much, just because I don't want to get nervous already. I mean, it's a little over two weeks away still, and we still have some pretty important prep work that needs to go in, and I think I'm ranked about 10th, and you need to be I want to say top three or four. I'm leaving the 25th and um, it's just like a big event. It's just a bunch of races and they have all the distances and then you just have like one shot at your distance and they'll pick anywhere between the top three and five people to go for that distance. Keep your eyes on Daniel Barrett. She had some of her best time trials leading up to the Olympics, and while she didn't make it onto this year's team, she's focused on representing the U.S. in 2018. Now, back here at the Polar Bear Plunge, the support for Special Olympics Minnesota continues as the bravest of the brave step up and jump in for a good cause. And who's next? 
is his flat Julie! Oh, she can't be here with us, so we made a flat Julie. She's jumping She's in jumping. with you. Yes, she is. What's, what's, the, what's the best part and the worst part about doing this gift? There is no worst part. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. And it's all any, good. any tips for future jumpers? How do you prepare? You, you. Liquid courage. the barely open feel really warm. It will. Okay, I'm going to do it again. Woo! Ken, way to go, man. I really did not want to get in that water. see is a little bit of her eyes. Mary, how's it going today? It's cold. It's it, cold. It's dang cold. Tell everyone why you're out here doing some taping today. Well, I'm here capturing our local law enforcement and fire department, and they were the first to plunge today. They had great groups. They had a lot of fun pre-partying, and um, they were having a good time in the tent, so we enjoyed hooking up with them. And They've been doing this for many years, right? Yeah. They're part of the, the reason this happens here. Absolutely. They, you know, law enforcement is... I mean, they support this more than anyone, so they've been doing this for years, and it's so important to them. That's why they keep coming here year after year, and even when it's one degree. Ah, it's crazy. <laughs> well, Mary, we know you're out here doing your your work, and uh, we're going to warm up after you and me. You know what I mean? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So carry on. All right. Woo. people jumping in for Special Olympics. A big thank you to all who shared their experience with us. Right now, we want to share a little bit of our own history with you. 2014 marks the 30th anniversary of community media here in the Northeast suburbs. And to kick off our year-long celebration, we'd like to show you a little clip from a local image show we did 10 years ago about how it all began. Take a look. In the early days of public access, there was sort of this identity crisis it had, or, or kind of a who am I, or what are we, or do we matter, or does anybody care? Because what's cable? Nobody knew cable, nobody knew how it started, what it's doing. It really didn't have a definition of what it should be, what it shouldn't be. It's hard for the public to get a grip on what this public access thing is, you know. It's, uh, public access is, is kind of like the library in, in, in that we check out the book, but we don't read it to you. And you can come in and you can make anything you want, or you can participate with uh, uh, helping make programs that are produced by other people. That's the picture of the truck. And these were our, that's George Stoney, with Mark Hotchkiss and me. Axis actually had been around for probably, by the time Ram Wash came around, over, 
over 10 years, uh, George Stoney had started, pretty much started the concept out in New York. We were in the area office and it was our job to set each of the franchise areas up. And at some point we knew the, the, the main office was going to was going to close and we needed to get off at some bus stop so that we would have jobs for the future and uh, Ram Wash seemed to be the right place to do it. It's a lot of cable history that went through there. Group W, Cable TV North Central, uh, which is also known as Hauser Communications. Uh, then it was Meredith. Uh, Meredith was purchased by Continental. Then it was US West for a short period of time, which was bought by Media One. Media One was bought by AT&T, and now it's Comcast. Group W came in here in 82. That was when we turned Columbia Heights on. Ramsey, Washington was two years later in 84. Uh, part of the, f the, the franchise proposals were very specific about what each of the companies proposed to the cities they were going to give them. So we had a boilerplate of there's going to be this many studios, there's going to be this kind of equipment in each of the studios, there's going to be this much uh, portable, portable equipment. Way back when, the, the communities got together and they had to um, come up with $1,000 to start this organization, this joint powers. And the elected officials were the signers or the starters of this joint powers. And after, once it was going, once there was a cable commission, and I don't know all the legal details, but then they invited in one citizen besides the elected official. Well, I saw it in the newspaper, I applied for it, and I was one of the two selected. So we had 12 cities, and we had two people from each each community, so that means we had 24 board members. And there was, there was no books that you could go to the library and read what cable is, how cable happens, what's going on, how you do access. And so they started an access board, and I was, it was an independent corporation. The SEC was created as a nonprofit corporation, and uh, and didn't actually do, kind of work side by side with the cable company at that time to help get uh, the, the public access going. Uh, but really the cable company did it at that time and SEC sort of did some other things and kind of helped along the way, but eventually uh, the cable company transferred it, that, that public access function to uh, SEC completely and so that that was the nonprofit corporation here in the mid 80s uh, that, that took over the public access function eventually. Uh, it, it actually officially happened probably around 92, 1992. Uh, and then after that, then uh, the corporate entity, that nonprofit corporate entity, SEC, was merged into the Ramsey Washington Cable Commission and the nonprofit was dissolved, but we kept the, the SEC. Uh, logo and name and and so that identity remains you know all these years later although the kind of the who does it and how it was structured is, has kind of changed along the way. A lot of the commissions and if you go back and look at the volumes of materials that each of the cable companies put together when they franchised um, a large part of those volumes you can find will be, now this is from the company standpoint, the people they went out and talked to about access, whether they were in the community they were, were franchising or you know, talking to access groups in Minneapolis or the group in Fridley or, or whatever. Well, there had to have been a reason for them to go out and see, you know, ask these questions to make these promises to say Ramsey Washington you're going to get this many studios and this many porta packs and it was because there was a grassroots interest in the area well a lot of that came from the cable commission saying you know we want this we want these in in your proposal tell us what you're going to do there was a convention that year and we learned a lot those who went to this convention learned an awful lot about cable learned there was other people like us 
um, I learned that we were really a rich franchise because we we got a bunch of cameras, you know, we, we got a truck, we got a whole bunch of other things, and some people were starting out with nothing. So that gives you a little insight as to how public access television came to be. And in the months ahead, we'll share a little more of our history along with information on some exciting events we're planning throughout the year ahead. Until then, I'm Jenny Skyboss, and I do thank you for watching Local Image. Plunge! Plunge! Woo! Stanley, what on earth are you doing? Well, uh, the film is I... Didn't you say you always wanted to be in pictures? Well, yes I did, but not like this. Stanley, it's all about television nowadays. Look at this flyer I was handed at the high school game last night. It says you too can make TV. Well, Volunteer with On Location TV 19 and we'll show you how. Well, Arlene, what do you think that means? Oh. Stanley, pick up that film reel. Oh. It means that if you volunteer with On Location TV 19, you too can make TV. 
What are we? What kind of TV? <gasps> <laughs> if you volunteer for On Location TV 19, you can cover high school sporting events, community concerts, parades, and much more. Do you think that's why they had cameras at the game last night? Why, certainly. That's why they had those announcers, instant replay, and all that modern TV stuff. Ollie, do you think that I could operate one of those TV cameras? Why, of course you could. The folks at TV19 will show you how. Ollie, are we still living in the 1930s? No, of course not, you silly willy. Why do you ask such a question? Well, then why are we in black and white? That's what they call special effects nowadays. I'm sure if you wanted to appear in color, all you'd have to do is ask. Can we be in color, please? Our heroes from across the upper Midwest are coming home from wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Only now, some have a new battle to fight, unemployment. Hello, I'm Rocky Lynn, co-founder of Tribute to the Troops. I'm Sergeant Dejan Farrell. And I'm Captain Ron Jarvie. A survey of our troops serving overseas found 25% say employment is a major concern for them as they come home. Right now, the unemployment rate for today's veteran is 12%. That's twice the average of others living here in the heartland. These service members learn quickly. They've experienced with advanced technology and demonstrate teamwork, discipline, and leadership under difficult circumstances. This year, Tribute to the Troops, the Armed Forces, and the Upper Midwest Emmy Chapter are asking you to hire our today's veterans. Employers, you've seen what these veterans have done for their country. Think what they can do for your business. To hire today's veteran, visit PositivelyMinnesota.com slash veterans. Are you home? Awesome. Honey, you're not watching what I think you're watching, are you? No, I'm not doing anything. Cool. I knew it. How many times do I have to catch you watching this stuff? It's, it's not what you think. Oh, you're a real piece of work. Welcome to the July edition of Northeast Journal. I'm your host, Joe Cullen. <sighs> I'm sorry, I just can't help it. Ever since GTM put their shows online, I, I just can't get enough. Channel 16 shows, now online at gtn.org. Feed your addiction.